The animation begins by showing a place called Atlantis, where a big, scary tsunami was heading straight for. At that time, the people of Atlantis were terrified and ran around like crazy, desperately searching for a safe spot before their city got swallowed up by the huge waves. In the middle of all this chaos, the Queen of Atlantis noticed that her daughter Kida was super confused and scared. So she quickly grabbed Kida and pulled her close to keep her safe. But just as they were about to figure out what to do, something amazing happened. Out of nowhere, a magical blue light appeared in the sky, right above the Queen of Atlantis. She couldn't take her eyes off it. It was like she was under a spell. And then, out of the blue, the light snatched her up and whisked her away, up into the sky. Unfortunately, Kia was left behind, feeling really sad and missing her mom. But then, her grandpa came over and told her to shut her eyes. And guess what? The skylight formed this cool shield thingy, right in the middle of Atlantis. It was like a force field that protected the city. And just like that, the tsunami waves were like, nope, not today. And they backed off, leaving Atlantis safe and sound. Soon after, the scene flashed back to 1914 in Washington, D.C., the United States of America. At that time, in a super cool museum, we saw a bunch of folks who gathered around to see this young dude named Milo James. He's like a genius when it comes to drawing maps and studying languages. Today, Milo's got something big to share with everyone. He's talking about this crazy awesome idea he has about the legendary lost city of Atlantis. Milo starts his spiel by explaining that Atlantis was this mega advanced civilization back in the day. And to prove his point, he shows off all these pictures and stuff that give evidence of Atlantean existence. This guy is totally determined to find out where Atlantis ended up and he's using this ancient book called the Stepper Journal to guide him. It's like the OG handwritten note that talks about Atlantis and stuff. But wait, there's a twist. Milo realizes that the book's translation was totally messed up. Turns out, Atlantis isn't chilling out on the seabed near Ireland like they thought. Nope, it's actually hanging out in the icy waters of Iceland. Knowing that Milo's mind is blown and he's trying to explain all this to the crowd, when out of nowhere, his phone starts ringing. Then he grabs his phone and answers the call. And it turns out, it's some mystery person on the other end, warning him about something big. Soon after, Milo flicks on the light and starts explaining his fancy theory to the Stepper Journal. But get this, he's not talking to regular people like us. Nope, he's chatting away to statues. Yeah, you heard that right. He's got a thing for sharing his ideas with inanimate objects. After that, Milo goes about his business, doing some tidying up and stuff. But then, out of the blue, the wall clock goes all ding-dong, and he freaks out. Turns out, he's got to rush and present his proposal to find Atlantis to the museum board, led by this dude named Mr. Hacks. But oh no, before Milo can even get to Mr. Hacks, he gets this letter. And sadly, it's a big fat rejection from none other than Mr. Hacks himself. Can you believe it? Milo's totally bummed out. He even practiced his whole Atlantis spile with the statues in his room, just to impress Mr. Hacks and the rest of the board. Meanwhile, at the museum, there are these five dudes, all important and official, coming out of their fancy office. They're like the big shots, the board of trustees, all working for Mr. Hacks, the boss man. And at that time, they are having a chat about our buddy Milo and his obsession with Atlantis. But suddenly, Milo shows up at the museum anyway, determined to talk to these guys. He's all like, hey fellas, let's have a chat. But what do Mr. Hacks and his board do? They try to pull a sneaky move and dodge Milo, making him run for it. However, Milo, bless his heart, he's not ready to give up. He starts chasing after Mr. Hacks, begging for donations and approval to go find Atlantis. But Mr. Hacks, that doubter, he doesn't believe a word Milo says. He thinks Atlantis is just some old fairy tale, nothing more. But you know what? Milo's spirit is unbreakable. He keeps on trying to convince Mr. Hacks, even though it seems like a lost cause. And then sometime later, Milo heads back home the pouring rain. At that time, he finds a mysterious lady, a total stranger, sitting right there in his house. So this lady goes by the name of Helda Sinclair, and get this, she says she was sent by her boss to meet Milo. Helda starts explaining that her boss really wants to meet Milo and has something special to offer him. Soon after, Helda takes Milo to meet her boss, Mr. Withmore. Then they go to his fancy house, and Milo's like, whoa, this place is snazzy. But guess what? As soon as he steps inside, he spots a photo of his own grandpa hanging on the wall. Afterward, Milo gets to meet Mr. Withmore himself, and the dude starts spilling the beans on why he wanted to meet Milo. And get this, he gives Milo a gift straight from his grandpa to Milo. So that gift turns out to be original Stepper's journal, the very key to finding Atlantis. Now these two start chatting it up, and Mr. Withmore spills the tea on Milo's grandpa, who turns out to be this super famous explorer. But here's the kicker. The museum board peeps, those big shots, they've been smearing Milo's grandpa's name. 
But fear not, my friends, because Mr. Withmore has a plan. He asks Milo to get ready for an epic expedition to find Atlantis. And let me tell you, Milo's over the moon with joy. He's all like, let's do this thing. At the same time, Mr. Withmore has already prepared a list of the absolute best experts for the journey. Knowing that Milo can't contain his excitement, it's time to rally the crew and set off on a grand adventure to discover the lost city of Atlantis. Woohoo! The next day, Milo found himself aboard a submarine and he noticed the crew bustling around getting ready for their expedition. Soon after, Mr. Withmore called him over to meet Commander Work, the leader of the team. They had a friendly chat, but time was running out as the submarine was about to depart, so Milo bid farewell to Mr. Withmore and hopped on board. In the submarine, Milo headed to his room, ready to catch some Zs. However, just as he was about to drift off to sleep, a man named Molly appeared out of nowhere and woke him up with a start. He was quite upset because Milo had accidentally snoozed on the map that Milo had painstakingly crafted. Then Molly tried to shoo Milo out of the room. But as Milo was leaving, he accidentally bumped into Dr. Joshua Sweet. Soon after, the two of them exchanged introductions and had a friendly chat. Later on, Milo decided it was time to seek out Commander Wark. When he found the commander, he introduced himself and was introduced to the crew. However, it seemed like the crew wasn't too thrilled to have Milo around. Undeterred, Milo explained his theory about the legendary city of Atlantis, using an illustration of a colossal lobster-like creature called Leviathan that guarded its entrance. He even pointed out a route to Atlantis that resembled a sink's drain. Unfortunately, the crew found Milo's explanation a bit bizarre and had a hard time believing him. Commander Wark then dismissed his crew members. Not long after, though, they all spotted something intriguing on the seabed. When they shone a light on it, they discovered numerous shipwrecks scattered below. Excitedly, they continued their submarine journey through the depths of the Icelandic Sea. Soon after, a crew member named Packard overheard a strange noise and quickly reported it to Commander Wark. Curious, Commander Wark asked her to crank up the volume on the ship's speakers. As they listened, they realized that the sound resembled the roar of some creature. At first, Commander Wark wondered if it might be the Pope's voice. But when they looked outside the ship, they saw something jaw-dropping. It was a ginormous lobster named Leviathan, just like Milo had described. Without wasting a second, Leviathan attacked their submarine, sending Commander Wark and his crew into a frenzy as they scrambled to find a way to save themselves. Soon after, Commander Wark sprang the action and ordered his crew to unleash a whole bunch of combat submarines to fight off Leviathan. Sadly, their attempt turned out to be a major flop as Leviathan made quick work of their battle-ready subs, easily destroying them. As if things couldn't get worse, Leviathan fired a laser beam that pierced through their submarine, causing it to start sinking. Realizing the urgency, Commander Wark immediately commanded his crew to abandon ship and hop into the small submarines they had prepared. But Leviathan didn't give up. It chased them relentlessly making them doubt whether Milo's theory about Atlantis' entrance was just some silly prank. Miraculously, they managed to escape the clutches of Leviathan. Eventually, they reached the surface and witnessed the haunting sight of the ancient ruins of Atlantis. In a solemn gesture, Commander Wark and the others lit cannibals to pay tribute to the 200 submariners who tragically lost their lives and were unable to escape from the sinking submarine. So after that crazy encounter with Leviathan, they had to regroup and get back on track with their expedition. Then they started putting together some cool vehicles to help them keep going. Along the way, the Commander Wark had a brilliant idea. He made Milo the official signpost of the group. Armed with Stepper's manual, Milo became their trusty guide, leading the way through all sorts of tricky obstacles and rough terrain. Can you believe it? They even stumbled upon bizarre creatures that you won't find anywhere else on dry land. However, little did they know the indigenous tribes of Atlantis were secretly keeping an eye on their every move, watching them with curiosity and intrigue. After a while, they all decided it was time to take a break and find a cozy spot to rest. That's when Dice, the awesome chef of the crew, stepped in and whipped up a scrumptious feast for everyone. Meanwhile, Milo, who was initially munching away by himself, got called over by Dr. Sweet to join the gang for a meal. As they chowed down, Milo couldn't resist taking a peek at Stepper's journal and noticed something peculiar. It turned out the journal was missing a page. After knowing that Milo couldn't keep this juicy secret to himself, so he spilled the beans to the rest of the gang. Then, after their hearty meal, they figured it was time to hit the hay and set up a cozy tent to catch some Zs. But guess what? Just as they were all snuggled up, ready to doze off, they spotted the tribesmen of Atlantis sneaking their way towards their sleeping spot. Meanwhile, in the middle of the night, Milo suddenly woke up with a desperate need to pee. As he stumbled out of the tent to relieve himself, those cunning Atlanteans cleverly hid, watching his every move. But here's the real kicker, so while Milo was doing his business, he found himself surrounded by a swarm of glowing bugs, kind of like fireflies. Annoyed by these pesky critters, he did what any frustrated person would do. He swatted at them. 
And suddenly, the bugs turned into little balls of fire and started zooming straight towards the tent. Then the commotion woke up the whole expedition only to find their tent going up in flames thanks to Milo's accidental insect bashing spree. Oops. In a panic, they all dashed to their vehicles, desperate to save themselves from the fiery mess. But just when they thought they were in the clear, disaster struck again. Then, as they raced across a bridge, those fiery bugs stuck to their vehicles like glue, causing their rides to explode into bits and sending them tumbling into a dark, deep ravine. Thankfully, everyone miraculously survived the fall. Then they gathered together, scratching their heads, trying to figure out how on earth they were going to escape this crazy situation. Commander Rourke was just about to turn to Milo for some much-needed advice, but oh. Turns out, Milo wasn't with them. Now they were all really scratching their heads, utterly perplexed. Meanwhile, while everyone else was in a state of confusion, poor Milo was out cold, totally unconscious. Soon after, he woke up to find himself surrounded by the Atlanteans, and among them was Kida, who had blossomed into a stunning young lady. When Kita noticed Milo's injuries, she couldn't help herself. She went up to him and gently touched his wound. And guess what happened? Bam! Milo's boo-boos magically vanished into thin air. But their little moment of magic got cut short because suddenly, the drilling vehicles of the expedition members appeared out of nowhere. Oh! Kita and her pals swiftly darted away to hide. And at that time, Milo wasn't about to miss out on the action. He tagged along, trying to catch up with them. He was dying to find out who these mysterious Atlanteans really were. Soon after, Milo finally reached a jaw-dropping site. It was an unbelievably beautiful city, surrounded by majestic waterfalls that seemed to go on forever. But shortly after, the rest of the expedition members, who had been searching high and low for Milo, caught up to him as well. And their jaws dropped just like Milo's did. They were completely blown away by the breathtaking beauty before them which was the legendary city of Atlantis itself. Soon after, a mass tribe of Atlantis showed up and started questioning the expedition team. But they were speaking their own tribal language, a language that only Milo knew. Can you believe it? Milo, being the language whiz that he is, responded in the Atlantean tongue, impressing the tribe. And guess what? One of them took off their mask, revealing a familiar face. It was none other than Kida. Then Milo explained everything to Kida, and finally, she got the gist of it all. She even extended a warm welcome to the expedition members in the fabulous city of Atlantis. Soon after, Kida and her Atlantean pals led the expedition members to meet her grandpa, who happened to be king of Atlantis. Turns out, the king already knew why the expedition team had come snooping around Atlantis. He wasn't too thrilled about it and straight up told them to hit the road and leave immediately. But here's where things get interesting. Commander Wark, being the smooth talker he is, stepped up and asked the king for a favor. Pretty please, could they rest in Atlantis for a bit? You see, Commander Wark knew they were all exhausted and needed a breather. And guess what? The king took pity on their weary faces and granted their request. Eventually, it was time to bid farewell to the mighty king of Atlantis. But before they left, he had some wise words for Kida. He advised her to be cautious about letting just anyone waltz into their territory. Seiki first, you know. On the other hand, Commander Wark and the gang were determined to dig deeper into the secrets of Atlantis. They were on a mission to uncover all the juicy details about this ancient civilization. But guess what? Commander Wark had a brilliant idea. He chose Milo for the job. He did that because Milo happened to be a language expert when it came to all things Atlantean. Soon after, Milo gets to work and suddenly he bumps into Kida. She's like, hey Milo, let's take a stroll through Atlantis together. And Milo's like, sure thing, Kida. Then, as they wandered around, Kida spilled some beans. She shared a crazy story from the past how Atlantis got smacked by this ginormous tsunami, causing it to sink and transform into what it is today. Not to be outdone, Milo chimed in and started telling Kida all about the civilizations that thrived on the surface of the Earth. It was like an exchange of mind-blowing information. And then they decided to climb this super cool cliff to get an epic bird's eye view of Atlantis. At that time, Milo blown away by what he saw. The next day, Kida was like, hey Milo, come join us and check out the daily hustle and bustle of our awesome city. So Milo and the gang followed her, getting closer and closer to the action. There, Milo was thrilled. Soon after, he introduced his buddies to Kida, and they all had a jolly good time sharing a meal with the residents of Atlantis. Now hold on tight because things are about to take a twist. Remember those mysterious masked guys? Well, guess what? They snuck into the expedition team's car and nabbed some air rifles. The next day, Milo was just chilling, playing around with this funky beetle-like critter, when out of the blue, Kida was like, hey, let's take a dip in the lake. Without hesitation, they both dove into the deep, mysterious waters. Kida had something special to show Milo. Then, as they explored the depths, Milo spotted this rock with a star-like symbol etched onto it. 
It was like something out of a cosmic adventure. Suddenly, his curiosity was piqued and he just had to find out more about these symbols. Little did he know they held the key to the heart of Atlantis itself. The symbols revealed that Keita's precious crystal stone was what protected Atlantis. At that time, Milo even tried to dig up more info in Stepper's journal. But, oh no! The explanation about the heart of Atlantis happened to be on the missing page. Soon after, Milo emerges from the lake's surface and all of a sudden, Commander Wark pops up, showing off the missing page from Stepper's journal. And guess what? That page has a super important picture of the heart of Atlantis. But wait, there's more. Turns out, Milo's crew and Commander Wark's crew were up to no good. They had betrayed Milo. They had come to Atlantis with one mission in mind which was to swipe the magic crystal that protected the city, the heart of Atlantis itself. At that time, Commander Wark, thinking he's all smooth and stuff, tries to tempt Milo into joining their crystal-stealing escapade. But Milo, being the hero that he is, firmly refuses. And just when you think things can't get any crazier, three mysterious characters who appeared earlier suddenly attack Kida. Oh! But guess what? Those three peeps were actually Commander Wark's hired guns. Soon after, things take a dark turn as Commander Wark and his men take Kida hostage and force her to spill the beans on the crystal's location. They even go as far as hurting the mighty king of Atlantis and threatening him with guns. But hold your seahorses, because something unexpected happens. Commander Wark spots this peculiar stone in the palace courtyard. Its shape is just like the symbol on the cover of Stepper's journal. Suddenly, curiosity gets the best of them, so they approach the stone formation. And what do they find? An underground room with a mysterious lake and giant floating masks. Wah! Now, here's where things get super intense. Commander Wark, with all his bravado, walks up to the edge of the lake and casually kicks a little pebble into the water. And boom! The masks that were all calm and collected suddenly light up with a fiery red glow. Soon after, the crystal necklace that Kida wears starts shining like crazy, as if it's being drawn to the energy of those giant masks. So Kida, just like her mom in front of her, gets totally mesmerized by the dazzling light emanating from inside the masks. Suddenly, she floats right into the light, disappearing behind those mysterious masks. After some time, Kida returns, suddenly she's got some funky powers now. Rays of energy surround her, making her look totally epic. And you know what happens next? Those massive masks, they tumble right into the lake. Knowing that, Commander Wark decides to crate up Kida, like she's some kind of treasure. But before he takes off, he just has to say goodbye to Milo. And how does he do it? Oh, just a friendly farewell punch right on Milo's noggin. Bam! Poor Milo takes a tumble, and to make matters worse, his precious childhood photo with his grandpa is flung out of his bag and destroyed. Fortunately, Dr. Sweet, Mole, Packard, and the rest of the crew who were appointed by Mr. Whitmore, they see through Commander Wark's wicked ways. They're like, nah. We're team Milo all the way. Then once they reach the other side, Commander Wark goes full-blown bad guy and destroys the only way out of Atlantis, the bridge. Soon after, Dr. Sweet takes charge and tells Milo to approach the limp and lifeless king of Atlantis. But suddenly, the king opens up and starts spilling the beans about the history of Atlantis to Milo. After sharing the tale, the king does something super important. He hands over a crystal necklace to Milo. And not just that, he also leaves behind a heartfelt request for him to save Atlantis and our girl, Kida. But sadly, the king takes his last breath right after that. What a roller coaster of emotions. Now, this is where things get super serious. Milo feels the weight of the world on his shoulders. He knows he has a massive responsibility to fulfill. So, without wasting any time, he sets his mind to catch up with Commander Wark and rescue Kida. There, he manages to get his hands on this ancient flying vehicle that the Atlanteans themselves couldn't even use. But hold on, folks. The Atlanteans are not just going to sit back and watch. They're all fired up and ready to go, thanks to Milo's inspiring teachings. So, with newfound enthusiasm, Milo and his Atlantean pals set off on a daring mission to save Kida. On the other hand, Commander Wark decides to fire a rocket from the volcano crater below, hoping it will blast them right up to the surface. However, he doesn't stop there. He snatches Kida and hops into a hot air balloon. But suddenly, Milo and the gang appear out of nowhere, ready to put up a fight. And you know what happens next. Commander Wark is all panicky and orders his men to shoot at Milo. It's an all-out battle, folks. Swords clashing, fists flying, the works. However, Milo, being the clever guy he is, tries to stop the hot air balloon. And what does Commander Wark do? He's so threatened that he decides to lighten the load. But suddenly, he throws poor Helda out of the balloon. Of course, Helda, feeling all annoyed, fires her gun right at that hot air balloon. Then the balloon explodes into smithereens. Meanwhile, Commander Wark is seething with anger and launches a brutal attack on Milo. 
But fortunately, Milo's got a trick up his sleeve. He takes a piece of the broken glass from the crate that held Kita, and suddenly, the glass is infused with her crystal energy. Then Milo uses it as a weapon, striking Commander Wark. Soon after, Commander Wark's body turns into a fragile crystal and shatters into pieces. Wah! With Commander Wark out of the picture, Milo finally releases Kita from the crate, and they both tumble from the blimp. But wait, there's more! Just when they thought they were in the clear, the volcanic crater starts rumbling and spewing hot magma waves. At that moment, Milo, being the hero he is, grabs Kida and the gang and rushes them out of the entrance of Atlantis to safety. Fortunately, they make it just in time. Finally, they regroup at the palace courtyard, the heart of Atlantis itself. Then, once Milo freed Kida from the chest, a magical sight unfolded in the palace courtyard. Suddenly, a brilliant blue glow emanated from the ground, weaving through the air like a mystical thread, linking one place to another. Astonishingly, this radiant energy caused the colossal masks which had plummeted into this submerged lake to gracefully ascend to their original positions. But that was not all. Kida's own power surged forth, summoning the guardian statue of Atlantis to rise and shield their city from the impending volcanic eruption. With a luminous shield in place, Atlantis was safeguarded from the scorching magma beneath the Earth's surface, rescuing their beloved home from utter destruction. Shortly after, Kida gracefully descended from the sky, landing back in the magnificent city of Atlantis. Seeing that, Milo couldn't contain his joy, and they all celebrated the fact that Atlantis had regained its usual splendor. Then, as time passed, Milo's companions from the expedition made the decision to return to their homes on the Earth's surface. They bid farewell to the inhabitants of Atlantis, exchanging heartfelt goodbyes. But Milo, being his adventurous self, chose to stay behind and continue his life in Atlantis. Before parting ways, they gathered for a group photo, capturing the memories of their extraordinary encounter. Later on, the expedition team reunited at Mr. Whitmore's house, eager to recount their thrilling adventures in Atlantis. Mr. Whitmore was all ears, listening intently as they shared their remarkable tales and proudly displayed the photos they had taken as evidence of their incredible journey. To everyone's surprise, Milo presented Mr. Whitmore with special souvenirs. It was a dazzling crystal necklace and a heartfelt photograph of Milo with his grandfather along with a personal message. The scene closes by showing Milo as an integral part of the Atlantean population. Not only that, but he and Kida tied the knot and became husband and wife. Together, they skillfully carved masks out of stone, a lasting tribute to the former king of Atlantis. Now the city remains hidden from the outside world, thriving in its restored glory. The animation ends. The moral lesson from this animation is don't swat at bugs, or you might accidentally set your tent on fire and end up on a wild adventure to save the lost city.